Okay, good afternoon. This is Richard Shu, host of Shoe Untied. Today, I'm very pleased to have with me as my guest, Scott Luffglass, who's a partner at Free Frank. Scott, welcome to the program. Oh, very nice to meet you, Richard. Good to see you. So, Scott, why don't you start by telling me uh, why you went to law school in the first place? So, I bet I went to law school for a reason that a lot of people went to law school, which is really all the wrong reasons, which is if you took all of the things I've ever written as a little kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah. I think I always wrote I wanted to be a lawyer. Uh-huh. And I'm not sure I had any idea what that meant or why I wanted to be a lawyer. <laughs> but by process of elimination, I am not a particularly athletic person, so sports were off the table. Uh-huh. And I didn't want to go to medical school, and I didn't want to become an accountant. Uh-huh. And a very myopic view of, call it 13, 14-year-old Scott Luffglass, that left law school, and I guess I wrapped my arms around it. But I did a lot of um, high school and college debate, again, uh-huh. I know that it's hard to imagine that after my disclosure about my athleticism, but <laughs> I did a lot of high school and college debate, and I really liked the art of argument, and I liked the art of being linear and trying to convince someone that your argument is correct. Yeah. And there were skills or at least interests that seemed to foot well with being what I believed at the time was a lawyer, and yeah. that's yeah. my origin story. Well, when you went to law school, did you have an idea of what kind of lawyer you wanted to be or a, what kind of career you wanted to have as a lawyer? I think I always wanted to be a litigator. I think part mm-hmm. of that was for well-founded and part of that was for poorly founded reasons. Mm-hmm. The well-founded reasons was I liked arguing. I liked being on my feet. I liked um, the sensation of trying to convince a room full of people that you were right. And having an audience was always something I frankly enjoyed quite a bit. Mm. So those were skills that felt like litigator skills as I understood them at the time. I think law school, and I always say this to summer associate candidates, I think the structure of law school really does skew people towards litigation, particularly in that first year where you're learning through reading cases, the examination, if you will, in the classroom is largely Socratic. I think a lot of it kind of errors towards the skills that make one a good litigator, or at least make one want to be a litigator. Yeah. And also that some of them were probably for ill-founded reasons. I think that my view of what a litigator was at the time largely was sort of informed by television shows that showed someone in front of a lectern or standing in front of a jury and arguing and convincing people and having their big watershed moments. So I think the confluence of those factors led me to, to go in, into litigation coming out of law school. So, and so tell me about that. Is that, is that, is that what you ended up doing? Is there something you liked? What, what was it, what was it uh, like? So I think, I think what I would say is that the aspects of it that excited me at the time, I've been able to incorporate into my practice, but what ultimately my practice evolved into, and it happened pretty quickly, really is a hybrid between a classic litigation practice and a classic M&A corporate governance boardroom practice. Mm. So much of what I do is sitting with public company boards and senior management teams, advising them on their fiduciary duties, advising them on Delaware corporate law, advising them in connection with transactions or crisis management or shareholder engagement or activism defense, and advising them on what the litigation risk is of taking one course of action or another, And then when those things emerge into litigation, Mm -hmm. I'll be the one standing up in court, mostly in the Delaware Court of Chancery and arguing the client's case. What I found was that it was really important to not wait as a litigator until a litigation was filed to develop connective tissue with clients. Mm -hmm. It was important for you to show them on a clear day how you were in terms of judgment, in terms of problem solving, and really become kind of a trusted advisor to the client on a clear day, on a day-to-day basis. And then when those bet the company litigations happen, they already feel a degree of comfort with you, with your judgment, your style. And it's the natural thing for you to handle that litigation. And one of the things I've sort of become very fond of saying is not every lawyer is for every client and not every personality is for every client. And you need to give clients an opportunity to see you in all seasons and in different circumstances to get a feel for your judgment, your style, the way you talk people off the ledge, the way, unfortunately, sometimes you have to talk people onto the ledge. And the reality is, is that that is something that takes time to develop. And it's not something that just pops up when someone gets sued out of nowhere. Yeah, though that totally makes sense. How did you get into this area of litigation? Did you try other things? Did you know you wanted to do this or did you stumble into it? So uh, stumble into it is a pretty good way of describing it. And I know that, you know, my folks at Free Frank will probably be disappointed that I'm going to mention a lawyer <laughs> at another law firm, but this feels like a safe space. Please the do. The answer to your question is a gentleman at, Locktail Lipton named Bill Savitt. 
Um, now, Bill Savitt at the time was an eighth year associate when I started at Wachtell Lipton. Hmm. And I started working with him and frankly, almost exclusively with him for a couple of years. Hmm. And Bill ultimately became a partner. Fast forward to last year, he became the co-managing partner of Wachtell Lipton. Hmm. And Bill did a ton of Delaware deal litigation. Hmm. And I enjoyed working with Bill and I enjoyed the pace of these matters because really Delaware deal litigation is in my view, the perfect hybrid between the elements that people enjoy about a corporate practice and the elements people enjoy about a litigation practice. Yeah, right. One of the biggest criticisms of being a litigator is these cases go on for years and years and years. And you know you could start your career and end your career and still have some cases on your portfolio or your docket. The reality is these Delaware deal lawsuits, fiduciary duty lawsuits, they tend to be on an expedited basis. Hmm. They're in front of highly sophisticated judges, the best judges in the country, in my opinion. And they have a direct appeal up to the Delaware Supreme Court. So these cases, when you get them, really are much more compartmentalized and often driven by the corporate deal timing. Yeah. So the result of it is you get in and you get out of these lawsuits hmm. a lot more quickly than you would if you had a typical classic civil litigation. Yeah. I think that creates a little bit more excitement and pace to the day-to-day -day practice, but it also has more of an intersection between a corporate practice and the litigation practice and a lot more interaction with directors and senior management members as opposed to just sort of plotting through with facts and law. Mm. And I find that very satisfying. So you asked the question sort of when I got into it, I started doing a bunch of it with Bill and walked to Lipton in you know, the early 2000s. And then I, I guess I wasn't terrible at it. So people asked me to do a lot more of it and I enjoyed it a great deal. And it's become the sort of the central focal point of my practice since. Interesting. Now that's not like a really cool practice. It sounds like you're very good at it. it sounds like it's been a very successful practice. I understand you recently took on a management role though at the firm. What made you decide to do that? How did that kind of present itself? Sure. So uh, I'm currently the vice chairman of the law firm, along with two of my partners and very close friends, Steve Epstein, who's the managing partner who's been on this podcast before. Yeah. I won't tell you, Richard, but we have a small side bet on the number of views. So <laughs> if you want to promote this and, uh, and get a kickback, I'm happy to arrange it with you. And my partner, Ken Roche, who is the chairman of the law firm, the three of us work together for the day-to-day -day management of the firm. Mm -hmm. How did the opportunity present itself? Frankly, it's exceedingly humbling, which is that we had a committee of folks at Freed Frank who made a recommendation to the full partnership on firm leadership. I'm very fortunate and grateful that I'm one of those three people. It's a tremendous amount of responsibility mm -hmm. and it's a, a very serious responsibility and um, very excited to do it. I will tell you that Doing a hard job with people that you absolutely adore, which is the case with Ken and Steve, yeah. makes that all the more gratifying. And you know, we can talk about this in a couple of minutes, but there are aspects of this job that take the things I like most about being a lawyer and actually put it on steroids. Oh, right? interesting. That's been gratifying. Well, that's the segue for the next question. What are those things exactly? Sure. So, so allow me to take a step back for a second. If you ask me like what I enjoy about being a lawyer the most, mm -hmm. It's that feeling of taking a challenging problem for creating a solution that makes them feel like you understood what they were going through and what their problems were. Yep. In a typical litigation or even in an M&A context, there's two things that make that a bit fraught. One is the duration of solving their problem. Generally, our matters take you know, months, sometimes years, usually months, and therefore from start to finish, you don't necessarily get that feeling of having solved a problem instantaneously. And then the second thing is you're often helping a corporation or a private equity sponsor. And yes, there's a general counsel or a CEO or a board that's grateful and that you feel like you've accomplished something for, but often you're helping an institution, a collection of individuals. Mm -hmm. I think the responsibility Ken and Steve and I have taken on gives us the opportunity on a day-to-day -day basis to help solve people's problems, not just our partners, not just our lawyer population, but our ever important business services population, which is really critical to our success. Mm -hmm. And the feeling, frankly, of taking people who raise issues to us and improve their day-to-day -day experience as being a lawyer, a young adult, a business professional, that's intensely gratifying. Mm -hmm. And it feels very much like the feeling you have at the end of an M&A deal or the feeling you have in a victorious litigation, but you get to have it more often and you get to feel the incremental change as you do that for more and more people. And the other thing that's great about it is 
you just learn a lot about people and you learn about the different paths people take to get to the same place, mm. which is really eye opening. The fact mm. that we have 750 lawyers and 400 non lawyers, and every one of those people has a really interesting and distinguished story about how they got here. Yeah. The process of learning about their backgrounds and learning about their origin stories. And then thinking about our firm as this great place where all these people come and converge and work together, it frankly gives you a lot of faith in institutions that I think a lot of people don't have sufficient faith in institutions. Yeah. Well, one of the questions I asked your colleague, and I'll ask you too, is how you know how he manages, how he runs a firm or is a chair of a firm and still manages to keep his active practice. It sounds like you're trying to do the same thing. Let me ask you, how do you juggle those two things? Because I'm sure each could be a full-time job. It's hard. And, you know, each so each is right now a full time job in the sense that <laughs> I think both Steve and I and Ken as well, though you haven't had Ken on, we've all just expanded our bandwidth to make time for everything. I would say that the biggest adjustment is actually not one of time, because hmm. in some ways we've conceded the field on time. All of us have just <laughs> started working as much as one could humanly work. Yeah, It's more about what I'll call mental and emotional bandwidth, which is you have to allow that every day at some point, something completely unexpected is going to come on your plate, need to be dealt with that day, and need to be dealt with in an appropriate way that involves collaboration with people in different groups, different business services, Ken, Steve, myself. And you need to kind of mentally be prepared that that's going to come when you don't see it coming. Mm. Um, and that you have to be ready, if you will, to drop a lot of things that you plan to do in that day. And you have to be nimble and willing to kind of come mentally out of the issue you were working on for a client matter, solve this issue or address this issue or get help to address this issue, and then be able to come back quickly into that thing that you put down. And that can be a very kind of taxing mental exercise, but it's also one that's a little bit like muscle memory in the sense that once you get doing it more and more, it becomes easier and easier to do it. Hmm. I also think one of the things that's quite nice, and this comes a lot from the respect that can Steve and I have for each other is that if I'm just absolutely swamped with a client issue and mm. something's principally in my lane, if you will, from a firm leadership perspective, Ken and Steve are there and are there to pick it up, if you will, and vice versa. And that's really the, the wisdom, if you will, that our partners had in coming up with a structure that has three people mm. rather than a structure of one person. It takes some of the responsibility and pressure off of us because each of the three of us has committed and it was very important to each of us to maintain our practices. Yeah. So it allows us to do this job without coming at the expense of delivering a good product to our clients, which is the number one objective. No, well, that all makes sense. Well, do you get to have fun doing this job? Is it, is, it, a is, that, is that, is that word you would use to characterize some of it? I, I absolutely would. Now, part of that is, I think that one of the hallmarks of our firm that distinguishes us from some other firms is that we take our work very seriously, but we don't take ourselves all that seriously. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So there's a lot of comfort, perhaps maybe too much comfort, that my partners have in making fun and in, in having fun with me at my expense. And if you don't take yourself that seriously, frankly, you can find a lot of joy and a lot of humor in everyday crises, and we do. I also think that Steve and Ken and I have the kind of relationship and the kind of rapport where we look to have the fun and we look to enjoy it. Yeah. I also think, and this is my philosophy on organizations, the best thing we can do for our partners is give them as much oxygen to be themselves as possible. The more people feel like they need to put on a character, if you will, when you walk in the door, whether that's in furtherance of conformity or that's in furtherance of being a quote, freed Frank partner, that's mental bandwidth and noise that stops them from being the best version of themselves. So one of the things the three of us have prioritized is to try to create an environment where people feel like their idiosyncrasies, their uniqueness is embraced. And that's really, frankly, where the most fun comes out because you start to see parts of people's personalities that maybe in a different world or at a different firm, they don't feel like they're allowed or encouraged to show. So we do try to encourage as much of that idiosyncrasy and individuality as can be. Yeah, well, that's so cool. Well, Scott, this has been a fascinating conversation. I really appreciate your taking the time, given that you've got a full-time practice and you're full-time in management. It really means a lot for you to come and share your story and insight and congratulations on this new position. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. This is Richard Chu and Scott Loveglass. Thanks. Thanks.